بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Um, we like to call it uh, Deen in Dunya, the blossoming Islamic startup scene, but a better way to remember it is Muslims getting their mojo back. Okay, Muslims getting their mojo back. Uh, what do I mean by this? So let's start, we have to kind of go back through history. Uh, anyone know what city this is? Yes. Good guess. It's not Cairo, though. Yes. Nope. That's a lot of water for Medina. <laughs> uh, close. You're close. You're getting closer now. This is a famous city. Uh, it's ancient in American age, right? Because like cities in America aren't more than a few hundred years old. But in terms of global history, this is almost kind of a new city, and it's in. A place that we know as Mesopotamia or modern day Iraq. What city is that? Baghdad. Now, Baghdad, I mean, Iraq has really old cities, really old artifacts. But Baghdad is actually not one of those cities. Did Baghdad exist at the time of Prophet Muhammad? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. The uh, Harun al Rashid is the one that created Baghdad. Okay? So there was, this was uh, turned into the the capital of the Muslim Empire, they wanted their own city. And the, at that time, the Muslims were very confident. They were a growing empire. Um, they were very proud. And they said, we can invent the world's greatest city. And this was a very unique design. They made it a circular city. And in the middle of it, they put something very unique and special. Anyone know what that was? It's called Darul Hikmah, the House of Wisdom. Darul Hikmah. And it was a place that people of all face even all parts of the world would come and exchange knowledge and learn from one another. And we know this. This is our golden age. We talk about it, right? Everyone know about the golden age of Muslims? And it's not, rela not relegated only to Baghdad. What, what are the other things Muslims are responsible or we're responsible for as Muslims? What else are we responsible for? Okay, good. Spreading Islam. What else? Medicine, science, soap, coffee. We hear about it. Who, who's the inventor of algebra? Al Khawarizmi. You always are you about to say that? Al Khawarizmi. Uh, who, what's another favorite? You know, we have Ibn Sina with the medicine. There's so many famous Muslims we talk about in the past. But there's another part of our past we don't talk about as much. What's this city? What does it look like, this city? It looks kind of like Syria. Actually, that's very observant. It does look like Syria, but it's not Syria. It is Spain. Now, when you, yeah, it looks kind of like Granada. But is this Granada? It's, it's called Medina to Zahra. City of flowers, the city of beauty and adornment. And there's an interesting story. When the Muslims came to Spain, a lot of the early uh, caliphs were very, uh, very sincere in their faith. And so, for example, has anyone been to Granada or Alhambra Palace? A few people. Do you remember there's a calligraphy written all over the words of Alhambra Palace? Do you remember what it said? Good. La ghaliba illallah. What does that mean? No victor but God. The Muslims had, had seized Spain, built this incredible palace, but who did they acknowledge all of that was from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now you fast forward a few generations and you have this caliph named Abdurrahman III. And he similarly wanted to build a palace in a city that was beautiful and showed their civilization. But for whose sake? Was it for God's sake? Was he adorning it with La Ghaliba illallah? He actually built the city with the intention to reflect the majesty of their Umayyad dynasty. And it's a lesson from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we do things for Allah, it lasts. There's a permanence to it. But when our intentions become to seek glory in this world for ourselves, what happens? Downturn is taken away from us, right? There's a famous saying of Umar ibn al-Khattab, and I'm probably going to misquote him, but the meaning of it, anhu, was we Arabs were nothing, and God glorified us with the Quran. And glorified us with Islam. And if we seek that, that glory, that izzah from anything other than Islam, 
what's Allah going to do to us? Return us back to a lowly state. So this is kind of the sunnah of Allah in history. But I believe we're at a critical juncture in our history once again. Um, I, and I hope, I pray that it's a rebirth of our ummah. And I think we're seeing that. Uh, this is a map. We call this a Twitter heat map. You guys know Twitter, right? That thing Donald Trump uses. Right? He sends all of his presidential messages out of. So when someone uses a hashtag, like hashtag MCC, you can search on Twitter all the hashtags MCC and you see when people have conversations, for example, about MCC. So a few years ago, there was a hashtag that was trending and you can see it went viral across the whole world. And it started on the East Coast in North Carolina. You know what happened around this time, what, three years ago? Three or four years ago? Yes, our three heroes. Um, there was Dia Yusuf and Razan. Three young, amazing Muslims were killed. It was very horrific. Uh, and there's a hashtag that was spreading called hashtag chapel hill shooting. And if you look at what's happening here, yes, this starts in America, but as it spreads across America, it starts spreading across Europe, it starts spreading across the Middle East, it starts spreading across Southeast Asia, but it's also going to South Africa, to Australia, to New Zealand, to parts of South America. What I see here is the heartbeat of the global Muslim you guys travel, raise your hand if you traveled outside the United States. Like you laugh, like everyone does, right? Okay, I'm a white guy, so I'm gonna talk about white people for a second. If you just go to, like I'm from Michigan. If you go to a, a, a church in Michigan, and a bunch of white people, or black people, probably the same thing, and you ask them who's traveled outside the US, or who even has a passport, how many hands are gonna be raised? Almost none. But Muslims, subhanAllah, we just travel the whole world, right? And we've been traveling, we've been to these places, and I think you know, just as well as I, that if we hopped in a plane today and showed up in Johannesburg, and we walked into a masjid like this, and we say, hey, I just got off the plane, but I don't have a place to stay, I don't have any food, could someone host me, what's going to happen? They'll fight. They'll fight to host you, that honor to host you, right? Because, subhanAllah, our hearts are connected as Muslims. We can be brown or white or red or I don't know what colors, right? But, subhanAllah, we have this, this heart and it's still alive. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, the ummah is like what? One body. It's like one body. You know, and when some of it hurts, all of it hurts. And we feel that, like, you know, we see the Muslims struggling in. Palestine. I'm not Palestinian, but I care about that. We see the Muslims struggling in Burma, the Rohingyans. And you guys might not be Rohingyan, but you care about it, don't you? Like, subhanAllah, we see this, uh, and we, we don't see this, we live this experience. And so we came up with a word for this, gummies. But I don't mean your Haribo, Halal, delicious gummies from Turkey. This is an acronym we use. That stands for what? Can someone read that to me? Go ahead. That's right. Global urban Muslims who are educated in speaking. Global meaning we're part of the world. We're urban meaning we're not on farms. If we were, if we lived on a farm in Indonesia, we wouldn't be able to connect in the same way. So there's some sort of urbanization there. But Muslim, we're educated. And we can speak English. If you have those qualities, we can find this instant connection. It could be Johannesburg, it could be Jakarta, it could be uh, Jacksonville. Yet we have this kind of commonality, this common thread to us. Now what's interesting, how many Muslims fit this description in America? Basically, I mean most American Muslims. And how many Muslims are in America? Seven, I honestly think it's more like three million, but it's a few million. I don't know, 3 million, 5 million, 7 million, it's a handful. How many in Canada? Anyone know? About 1 million, 2 million, another 2 million in the UK, half a million in Australia. It's not a lot, right? It's just a few million, half a million, but you start adding it up, throw in South Africa, 
throw in the 5 million Muslims who are educated English speaking in Kuala Lumpur. Throw in the 10 million Muslims in Pakistan who fit this description. How big do you think this community adds up to of gummies? If you add up all the little pieces from all 170 countries in the world. 60, 70 million, 30 million. How about the sister side? How many Muslims from all over the world fit this description, do you think? I believe you're, get, you're getting closer. It's about 284 million. If it was a country, it would be the fourth largest country in the world, just behind the USA. So I'm going to ask a question. If this was a country, do you think this country of Muslims deserves its own TV shows, deserves its own books and stories and schools and websites and tools, right? Like, uh, would we expect China? Are we surprised, for example, that China has its own Netflix? No, it makes sense that China would have its own Netflix, right? Like, why should China have to use Netflix? Why can't they have their own Netflix? Is there their own culture and their own community? There's a common, common values there that may not be the values Hollywood has. So what about the Muslim community? Anyone know this one? What's this? Erthurgo. What is Erthurgo? Isn't this one? Do you speak Turkish? Anyone speak Turkish here? Okay, no one speaks Turkish. Raise your hand if you've seen this show before. Okay, how come half the room has seen a Turkish TV show and we don't even speak Turkish? Yeah, Arabic translation or the English translation or the Bahasa Malay translation. And this thing is translated to like every language that Muslims speak. But, but you know, what is it? So if you don't know what this is, this is like a Turkish drama about the father of Osman who founded the, the Ottoman Empire. And it's very popular as Muslims. It's on Netflix, in fact. In fact, we just talked about Netflix. And it's one of Netflix's most popular shows. Is there any nudity in it? Is there any cursing in it? Right? Like the things that, you know, repulses, like the things that are against our values, won't we'll find in this. Uh, but is this the first time Muslims have tried to make shows? What's another successful Muslim movie or TV show you know? Omar series? Okay, good. So we got the Omar series, which is just before this. And what about other than that? Maybe a movie. What, what movie do you know that's successful in the Muslim community? Good, The Message. Okay, Mustafa Akkad, Californian, I believe. What year was The Message made? I think someone said 70. 76, 78. So what? What was going on? All the 80s, all the 90s, all the 2000s. We went three decades without a movie or a decent movie or TV show. You know, I used to, and I'm talking about my story in a second. I used to be a film producer. We made a movie called Bilal Stan. I found that it did well. I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. And we were trying to raise Muslim move, money for Muslim movies with the Muslim. Uh, Muslim values, not even an Islamic movie, just like Muslim values. And we saw a lot of resistance. And it was fair objection from investors. They say, give me an example of a, a Muslim-based uh, movie of any kind that's made money. And if the only thing I can point to is the message, why would an investor have confidence that this idea we have is going to work? But this worked. What was unique? What's different? Why is Erythrogo Resurrection successful? Whereas for 30 years, we haven't had anything successful. What's, what's different now? Production quality. So I want to give you an example. I don't know if I have this slide. I'm going to, one more slide. i got to add a slide here, but I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, I became Muslim in 2001 uh, in the East Coast. Anyone from the East Coast, Massachusetts? Where are you from? Okay. Uh, I don't know what to say. Six, right? That's what you guys say. Go six or something. Um, okay, so I'm from Amherst, Massachusetts, a little town in Western Massachusetts. I became Muslim, and like a few months in, someone's like, hey, brother, you want a halal burger? And I'm like, oh, yeah, like, man, I've been eating, you know, uh, like, I haven't had any access to halal burgers. I can't wait. This is 2001. And they hand me this, like, kafta between two, like, pieces of white bread. And I'm like, what? 
what is this, right? But that was like a halal burger in 2001. I don't know how it is here, but I'm in Dearborn. I certainly am in Toronto. It's just like this. If someone offers you a halal burger in Toronto, how is it? It's amazing. In Michigan, is it like that here in California? Like halal burgers at the top of the chart? So-so. Okay, you guys got to work on it. In Michigan, it's like even the non-Muslims know the halal burger places are the best burger places, right? Even the non-Muslim restaurants will get the halal meat for their burgers. That's how strong our, our halal burger scene is. So what changed in the 16 years, uh, or 18 years since I became Muslim, with halal burgers? It's the same thing as Ertegol, the quality. So what is the point I'm trying to get to? We Muslims, do we have the size of 289 million gummies out there, right? We deserve our own products. But what's been missing for decades now has been the quality. But if we can build that quality, then I believe we can achieve some really great things as a community. And now we're starting to see it. So I want to share the story of Launch Good. We pray that we're on that path. And some more examples to share with you, even in your own backyard. Uh, my own story, I became Muslim 2001. This is me and my friend Mike Dan. Um, we were 16 at the time. Um, and like many convert, any, any people that entered Islam, you're convert, revert type people? Am I the only one in the room? Okay. <laughs> Go. Oh, so I'm going to say, if this was 2001, it was June. So three months after I became Muslim, and, and probably you guys know this, if you've ever seen new Muslims, like, mashallah, like you got the, the kufi on, right? And you're like, so proud of your Islam, and you're like, on the sunnah, like, you know what I mean? You're really strong in your faith. And then three months after I became Muslim, 9-11 happened. It was a very traumatic event for me, personally, because... Uh, I didn't know any Muslims, first of all. Uh, it, it, where we lived, the masjid was an hour away. So I knew Mike. I knew Malcolm X because I read his autobiography that helped me become Muslim. And I knew, like, one other guy. Um, and at that age, like, do I know Arabic yet? I haven't even finished the Quran. Like, I, I know very little about Islam. So if I want to learn about Islam, what do I have to do? There, this was, like, pre-Google, basically. What do I have to do if I want to learn about Islam? Go to masjid. You learn from the... Sheikh, right? So if the Sheikh has a beard like this, that might be good. But like this brother's beard is a little bit longer. So as a new Muslim, I might think what? He knows more knowledgeable. And then, you know, that brother's got a topi on, like a kufi, right? So maybe he's like even more knowledgeable. How did Osama bin Laden look? When I first saw him on TV, time on Island, how did he look? The longest beard and a turban. And a tho, and quoting the Quran. Can you imagine how difficult this is for a new Muslim? You know, I'm seeing, I'm like, subhanAllah, like, is this Islam? Like, I know Islam is true, and I want to be a good Muslim, but this can't be right. You know? So it sent me off on my own journey of discovery. And I was very blessed. Allah facilitated so much good in my life, alhamdulillah, mashallah. So I've got the chance to live and study in places like Turkey and Morocco and Malaysia. Jordan, uh, this is the Hajj, alhamdulillah. So this is all within like my first five years of being Muslim. And I came away with two strong conclusions. Uh, the first is Islam is not Osama bin Laden. And then we all know that, right? Uh, thank God. And I learned about the history of Muslims and the beauty of the Sunnah and the beauty of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it's like, man, we have, uh, we, we got a big PR problem there. The second thing I learned about Islam I think our Muslims is something I think we all need to reflect on. Muslims are pretty cool, okay? We're so hard on ourselves, guys. But all of you are nice. I'm sure if I came to your house, you'd make me some chai, you'd give me some falafel. I mean, I'd have a great time living with you for a weekend. Like, Muslims are so nice. Everywhere I go in the world, everyone treats me so well. Yet the image out there in, in movies, for example, is how are Muslims portrayed? Terrorists, women beaters, misogynists, like horrible images of Muslims. So at that time, I thought, you know, one way to change that is to get into film. And so we made a movie. I, I briefly referred to it. It's called Bilal Sen, about a young black Muslim in Detroit trying to go to school. It's a funny movie. It's, uh, 
uh, thoughtful movie. It did very well. We got a very lucky break and got into a festival called Sundance. Raise your hand if you've heard of Sundance. Or most of you, alhamdulillah. It's like the premier festival for movies, uh, for independent filmmakers. So we were so excited, but we were also so broke, right? So like, like, oh my God, we need to do color corrections and sound corrections and make DVDs and posters and a website, like all, all this stuff, and all this stuff takes money. We didn't have money. Now at that time, this is 2010, I had a friend from New York that said, hey, there's this new startup here, a new website, you should try it, called Kickstarter. Now, if you don't know Kickstarter, it's one of the world's largest crowdfunding platforms. It's helped raise over $3 billion for projects just like this. But at that time, it was brand new. It was about a year old, and we were the first Muslims to use it. We had a very successful campaign, alhamdulillah, um, but I started to fall in love with crowdfunding. Because it isn't just about the money. It's about the uh, story and the inspiration it provides. So like when we did this Kickstarter and we raised a bunch of money, then I had a friend come to me. He's like, you know, Chris, uh, I was thinking about doing this project where I drive around the world. Uh, sorry, I drive around America and I visit 30 mosques in 30 days of Ramadan. And I helped that friend end up doing a Kickstarter. And then uh, my friend over here and co-founder, Manny Kalawi, there she is, standing up. Um, she had a nonprofit that was working with teenage youth in Detroit, uh, Muslim youth, and I started working with her organization to do their own crowdfunding campaign. And I realized, like, subhanAllah, every time we do these campaigns, they inspire two or three more people to do their own campaign. And I thought, what if we Muslims had our own Kickstarter? What if we had our own platform that would support Muslims to do good work in the world? And that led to the creation of LaunchGood. So LaunchGood is this website that you can go to and raise money for whatever cause you care about in the world. Um, uh, an example of this, uh, a year, two years ago, this is a really a uh, very sad story. Two years ago, in the Trump mania, uh, there was a shooting in a mosque in, uh, outside of, in Quebec City. You guys remember that? You guys, Prince Aisha, and, and it's a horrible incident. Well, this brother, Ayman Darbali, he actually charged at the shooter suffered, of course, uh, severe injuries where he's uh, you know, paralyzed from it, but he saved many people's lives that day. But a year later, kind of the community forgot about him until a story came out in the Toronto Sun, I believe, or one of the big newspapers there, highlighting his struggle. And we partnered with some Muslims on the ground there. Uh, these guys, a group called Dawanat, the Toronto Muslims, um, and they ended up doing a campaign to raise money to buy him a new house that ended up raising over $400,000, and it got support from over 4,000 people, including many, many people of other faiths, Christian, Jews, or atheists, whatever. But as an opportunity, it shows that when Muslims come together, we can accomplish anything. It was just like an idea. It was like, oh, I was motivated. I read this story in the newspaper, and I feel helpless, but maybe I can do something about it. And that's what we care about as, for Launch Good, is this sense of empowerment. Yes, we are struggling as a community. Yes, we have many enemies working against us. We have many difficult circumstances we have to overcome, whether it's Islamophobia or racism or American foreign policy. But we always have something we can do. The Prophet Muhammad said, if you have a seed, even if it's a day of judgment, what are you supposed to do with that seed? Plant it. Will you get to see that tree grow? Will the tree even grow? Probably not. But it's about the intention and the action as a Muslim community. We should be the most empowered community of any in the world. You're supposed to be the best nation raised forth for mankind. Um, so how have we seen Launch Could develop over the years? This goes back to this idea I'm talking about. I believe we're at this rebirth, this tipping point. Uh, launch Good in... We launched in October 2013, so 2013 was incomplete year. But in our first year, we, we raised over a million and a half dollars, alhamdulillah. That total grew to six million, grew to 14 million, grew to 33 million. Uh, and at the end of last year, we just celebrated five years. Actually, I need to update these numbers. Uh, we're at almost 65 million dollars raised, alhamdulillah. And you'll notice, like, what, uh, just if about three years ago, we're at six million, and now we're at 65 million almost. Like, that's an incredible growth, and it's not because of us. I would love to say it's like because I'm so smart, I'm not. 
right? Or we got such an amazing team, we do. But I think more than anything, it's a reflection of our community. Our community is ready for quality. And that's the opportunity and, and the responsibility we all have. Uh, and if you're curious, this is our team for Launch Good. We're always looking to grow the team. We're about 16 or so team members spread across the world. Um, and I have a small video I want to play for you guys. Have you ever wondered about the past? The golden age of Islam, we call it, looking upon it with besotted eyes. Have you felt it? That remembering of a legacy. When we built great institutions of knowledge, achieved remarkable breakthroughs, not for the pursuit of this world alone, but for a purpose much grander than all of us. Have you ever wondered about the present? The sands that slip through our fingers and what we build with it. Today, here, now, our hearts are connected like never before. We are the storytellers. We're worshipers, we're seekers, lovers, creatives, and travelers in this life. Sometimes the journey is life-changing, and sometimes we change the world. Have you ever stopped and wondered about the future? Yes, we're a fundraising platform. We help people raise money on, online. That's what we do, but who we are is an inspiration platform. We're changing the narrative of who Muslims are. Most recently, we saw this uh, in October. There was a horrible incident in October in Pittsburgh. You guys remember what it was? The synagogue shooting. And there's a brother, his name is Tarek al Masidi, the founder of Celebrate Mercy. He went on launch and he created a campaign for the victims of that synagogue. It ended up raising over $200,000. And more importantly, it changed the narrative. What do most Americans think about Muslims and Jews? They hate each other. Oh, we must hate. Do we hate Jews? Muslims don't hate Jews. We have issues with what's going on in Palestine, but we don't hate Jews. And so we're changing the narrative of who Muslims are. And a lot of this is happening in your own backyard. And we've worked, been blessed to work with a lot of these organizations. What's this one? You guys recognize it? Tatlis. Now, subhanAllah, I was actually blessed when I started Launch Good. Uh, I came here to California to do a program there called M, uh, MMP, Muslim Mentorship, uh, Mu'allaf Mentorship Program. Have you guys heard of that? It trains people to work with new Muslims. And subhanAllah, we've sent several people from Michigan. We've come back to Michigan, and now we have an organization helping new Muslims. These are seeds of excellence that are being planted across the Ummah. Uh, there's another organization here called Gamma. A gathering all Muslim artists that are helping to promote artwork that has a purpose, a deeper meaning to it. It's not just this like grotesque modern art. Um, and even a lot of activism. So there's brother Stefan Clark, you guys know him, a convert to Islam up in Sacramento, brutally, you know, horribly killed by uh, police officers. And a uh, brother up there with CARE, Sacramento, Basim al Karra, he put together a campaign that ended up going viral. It got the support of celebrities, of athletes that all came together. And again, what's the narrative that's written when, we, when people see Muslims doing these type of campaigns? That Muslims are a source of healing for a community, a source of, of goodness for the community. We, people should love and want that their neighbor, for example, is a Muslim because they know that they bring good to them. And so thank you for inviting us today. Uh, may Allah bless you and honor us to be uh, leaders of the righteous. We love this dua. وَالَّذِينَ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا هَبَلَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّتِنَا قُرَّةَ عَيُّمْ وَجَعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا uh, And especially that last part, O oh Allah, make us for the pious leaders. We have a big opportunity in America. A big opportunity. I've traveled the whole world. I spent last year, parts of last year, living in Malaysia, traveling to Indonesia, uh, Singapore, um, Australia, New Zealand, all over the Middle East, Europe. And subhanAllah, American Muslims, we have this outsized influence on the world. I told you, we're like 3 million Muslims out of 1.5 billion. That's less than 1%. Less than 1% of the Ummah is American Muslims. Yet, we have this ability to influence all the way the world works because it's kind of a bad thing, but there's this American hegemony. Like American culture is everywhere. Omar, 
What's the number one recognized brand in the world? Coca-Cola. Everywhere you go in the world, they know Coca-Cola, right? What's number two? Pepsi, maybe, right? Like American culture is everywhere. We're kind of in the here in America, you know what we like to say is we're in the belly of the beast, right? But we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to move up into the heart of the beast and transform it into a beauty. So that's the end of our presentation. Jazakum al khairan. I want my uh, team to stand up. You can recognize them. Uh, Amani Kalawi is my co-founder, uh, our mighty mouse and chief operating officer. Uh, Nafi Rashid is from Calgary. Uh, she's our VP of operations. And Omar Hamid in the back is also our third co-founder and chief design officer. Uh, I guess we have maybe 20 minutes or so for Q&A. Uh, and then after Aisha, we're going to go hang out at... Um, Mirchi Cafe and Masala Pizza. Get some chai, get some desserts. It's our treat. We're going to pay. Uh, every, uh, our tea, our company is very interesting. If you remember this picture over here, our company is what we call a remote team. And you probably here in California know this more. Um, we only have two people working in our headquarters in Michigan. Almost everyone works wherever they live. Um, that could be Singapore, that could be London, that could be Calgary. Uh, and as a leadership team, every six months we come together to do leadership type stuff and strategy and planning, but also we use it as a chance to get to know the community better. So recently we were in Toronto over the summer, before that we were in Kuala Lumpur, before that we were in London, and we're honored to be your guests here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Jazakum khairan, thank you very much. Uh, a very short funny story is five years ago when we started LaunchGood, we actually made a visit here to the Bay Area. For money, of course, because we're fundraising, we're a startup. And every door was closed on our face. But politely, people were very nice. And we have a lot of successful Muslims, mashallah. Any of you guys work in tech? Yeah, there's a lot of successful Muslims in the tech industry. But have you ever heard of a successful Muslim tech company? No, it's never existed. So we were trying to raise money. It's just like the film industry, right? They're like, well, give me an example of any faith community having a successful startup. You know? Uh, and it was hard. I couldn't think of any. And so we didn't get any investors, but subhanAllah, we just bootstrapped our way. Um, and Allah blesses a lot, and you guys have supported a lot. So thank you. Uh, five years later, we've built this sustainable company. We're very grateful to be back here in San Francisco. Uh, and why don't you guys come up? We can answer some questions. I'm going to get sit down and be a little casual, inshallah. So any questions or comments? Is there anything you like or you want to correct about my, my presentation? Bismillah. Yes. So, so I think question, everyone heard my question. Yeah, yeah, and I'll repeat just in case. You know, the question is like, I guess maybe like, what's the tipping point? Like, what got? That's a great question. Um, and Manny, I think we, you answered that recently pretty well to one of our uh, donors. So I'm gonna pass it to you. Sorry, can you hear me? So I think if I heard your question correctly, it was what was our tipping point? Yeah. You know, that's, uh, I think, a really good question. Um, oftentimes, I used to think, okay, if we just get this one big campaign or if we just get this one influencer on board, if we're able to get, you know, every time we sort of knock a door and we get some maybe high-profile uh, campaign creator, I think that that would be the tipping point. But I actually think that uh, it was this gradual building of the team and the company and the culture, right? I think what most people don't know is that you know, as Chris mentioned, uh, we bootstrapped it. So five years ago, we came here, we knocked, we're like, hey, give us some money. And they're like, okay, your idea is cute, but we're not really, I don't know. I don't really think I'm in, right? And so um, we, we just bootstrapped it and we had gotten a $10,000 angel investment, right, to uh, launch a launch good. And what most people don't realize is uh, that's actually what most campaigns on launch good raise, four to 10,000. So a lot of small, a lot of great ideas just need a little bit of seed money to, to, to go somewhere. So we bootstrapped it. At, you know, at some point, we uh, were able to pay that investor back. And then like for three years, we didn't take any salary. Um, and that was a really big thing for us to be able to really continue to build it. And so gradually, what was sort of on our credit cards at the time, uh, which we had no idea if we'd be able to reimburse, and then eventually we started to, you know, kept hustling, kept pushing, kept pushing, started to be able to, you know, we were working full-time on part-time salaries, and then we kept pushing, kept pushing, and then 
alhamdulillah, we were able to get to a point where we're full-time on full-time salaries, right? So I say it's hard to kind of pinpoint one specific incident. I think the thing that um, I would say was the most important thing was that there was growth, right? Like it was going somewhere. And that was the piece that we knew we were, what we were doing was working. We just had to continue doing it, continue to innovate, uh, and then uh, building things that uh, really allow you to kind of uh, automate some of the uh, support you get. So, for example, our Ramadan challenge is a big deal, where for 30 days you can give to any project on the site and you give automatically. Things like that help you have sort of reoccurring revenue so that you're not stuck on you know, something seasonal, but... For me personally, it's hard to say this is the tipping point. We got this partnership because, you know, we're a collection of 5,000 stories and 5,000 campaigns. And over time, the model works where each campaign brings new people, new supporters, and all the new campaigns as well. That's a very long answer to your question to try to synthesize the last five years of, okay, what was that tipping point? Um, by the way, a uh, great presentation. Uh, not as familiar with launch code as maybe some of the rest. Uh, but uh, as someone working in technology, as I'm sure a lot of people should probably are, um, one of the issues that I see kind of plaguing the Muslim uh, tech scene, and the reason why I say tech specifically is because startups coming out of that industry are typically much more capital intensive than some of the uh, non-tech, let's say. The, the question I have for you is, one of, the mo one of the largest challenges that I see Muslim startups have is obviously raising that capital. And it's not, as a res it's not because of a lack of resources in the community, as much of it is a lack of financial investment uh, competency within the Muslim community. And so your platform is taking, obviously, the crowdsourcing approach. But has launched good? Have you guys ever thought about uh, maybe raising funds to help fill that knowledge gap within the Muslim community? Uh, and I'll give you an example, right? So, like, I'm I'm in the middle of starting my own startup right now. So I'll go to an investor, right? Very wealthy individual. Right? He'll put ten million dollars on the on the table. The stipulations that they will, uh, you know, associate with the, with this money is so infantile in its, in its kind of understanding from, from, a, from an Islamic investing standpoint, that it's like, why would I ever take this, right? Like, I'm shooting myself in the foot right now. And, and they're not doing it out of, out of malice or anything. It's just purely out of, they just don't know. So let me see, let me see if I can kind of regurgitate that question is like um, Muslim investors are not very sophisticated yeah so we, we had that issue ourselves like we mentioned we had an angel investor and then and it's a mentor of mine I mean it's someone I really look up to a lot but within two years of launching he wanted to start wanting dividends on a ten thousand dollar angel investment right I mean, you you understand how silly that is right and we acknowledge, okay, this is not going to end well. And we just came to an agreement, a, a certain uh, X ROI for him, and we just paid him back. And he was happy and we were happy, you know? Um, it is an issue. They're, they're, I think a, a great example uh, that we faced here, and, and I hope you wouldn't mind it, there's an, a brilliant Muslim VC. His name is Matmoon Hamid. Uh, he is an amazing guy, just a wonderful human being. Um, and at the time, he was running a firm called S&P Capital, Social Capital, Social Plus uh, something capital. And we met with him. And, he, and we met with him five years ago when we first started. And he was nice enough to at least take a meeting with us. We came back the next year, and he was impressed. He's like, year had passed. We'd grown quite a bit. We were still around. You know what I mean? Like a lot of startups fizzle out real quick. And he said he wanted to invest in us, but he's got a problem, which is his firm doesn't allow him to make his own investments. If he's investing as an individual, he has to invest on behalf of S&P because otherwise it's like he's saving the best opportunities for himself. But his firm wouldn't let him invest in a religious startup. So it's a catch-22. So I think there, there are people, we've got Omar Hamoui, we've got Matmoon Hamid, I mean, there's uh, oh, I think Omar Tawakko, uh, Osama Bidir. I mean, we have all these Muslim, 
Muslims are very successful in technology, built hundred plus million dollar companies, sold them, are sophisticated angel investors, but they themselves don't see an opportunity yet in this space, um, or they're in an environment that doesn't even allow them to invest in this space. So now you're left with like doctors or engineers or lawyers or people who've amassed wealth in other ways trying to invest in the tech space and they don't understand the development. Uh, I don't know what the solution is, but I, I, do, <laughs> I do resonate with that issue. Um, but inshallah, I, we're in a good position. I think if, if we could convince the Omar Hamouis and Mahmoud Hamids to uh, open up the community, it would be better. Um, but you know, to be fair to them, I still think um, this is not, it's hard to make an argument this is the space to invest in. Like you'd have to be a very brave investor. Because we go to conferences like there's one called Global Islamic Economy Summit. And they put us on the keynote and they put us on, on the main stage like we are the Facebook of the digital Islamic economy. And if you're the Facebook of the digital Islamic economy and this is your whole team, that's not good. Like the digital Islamic economy is very small, you know? So the, the opportunity for return on investment that's, is not there yet. Um, I don't know what the solution to that is other than we have to do a better job of growing this Islamic economy. And this is part of why we go around and tell you guys, like we have powers as consumers. Like how's Uber doing in China? Anyone know? Or Netflix, how's Netflix doing in China? How's WhatsApp doing in China? Part of it is the government of China itself, but part of it is the people. The people prefer to use WeChat over WhatsApp. It's their own platform they choose i forget the uber competitor they choose their own diddy they, they want to use diddy they want to use alibaba do, do they want to use amazon no they understand that it's better for us as, as chinese people to have our own alibaba over amazon and so they invest and trust themselves and i think that's important as a muslim community we have to take that do you think all all uh do you think uh um Alibaba was as good as Amazon 10 years ago? No. Or WeChat was as good as WhatsApp 10 years ago? Probably not. But they're willing to sacrifice a little bit of you know, quality for the future, that we're gonna invest in our own stuff. And I think that's important as Muslims. Assalamu alaikum. It's so great to finally meet you all. Um, you gotta tell people who you are. My name is Abbas. We've run two campaigns on the Launch Good platform for gathering all Muslim artists. Um, so you guys got a Launch Good right in your backyard here, alhamdulillah. Let's give him a round of applause. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I have two questions for y'all. Number one is, why is Omar not wearing the right socks? Uh, are we all wearing Launch Good though? Oh, that's so funny. And he's your head of design. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I designed these socks so he doesn't like them. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> they don't meet his standard. Um, so my question, uh, my question has to do with how you navigate uh, campaigns within the Muslim community. So Launch Good as a name, it's not very forthcoming as Muslim. I, when going through the website, you know, I found some campaigns that were created by non-Muslims. I found some that were created by Muslims, but for the non-Muslim community. Have you had to reject any projects? Do you draw a discernment? Is it a faith or an identity label? Um, what is your official strategy of navigating this, this space? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, if, if I understand correctly, how do we sort of discern between Muslim, non-Muslim? Um, and I think that one of the things that early on we kind of came to the agreement about is that if we try to be everything for everyone, we're just going to be mediocre, right? So, you know, we could be an ethical crowdfunding platform and maybe focus on certain things. Um, but then the line gets kind of, you know, it can get kind of blurry, right? Like, for example, uh, I could be uh, maybe a Christian who's doing sort of like a bar, a, a bar crawl campaign, right? Where you might, you know, you might bar hop at different places and it's a fundraising drive. So, us staying focused on our niche was probably, it, it was the defining factor. Like for us, we want to make sure that we focus on the Muslim community because we truly believe that there is so much incredible values that we haven't been able to tell people who we are. We've, we've spent so much time uh, defending ourselves that we can't even show people who we are. 
right? Like we're always saying we're not this and we want to be what we can do, we just will, right? And so uh, that was a key factor for us. And we've had people sort of say like, your, you could grow your pie so much more if you focus on, you know, like maybe the Jewish community or the Christian community. But again, there's something about being able to build something that's unapologetic, unapologetically Muslim and uniquely Muslim and, you know, cater to the Muslim community with the hold on challenge and try to give us that. So that being said, it doesn't mean that we don't support really amazing projects. So for example, when we, uh, you know, when Muslims raise funds for uh, black churches that were burned down in the South uh, or the Pittsburgh campaign, right? Or San Bernardino, whatever it might be. It's not saying that the good we're creating in the world is limited just to Muslims, right? And so we also have people who are non-Muslim that are like, hey, we just love your platform and doing a lot of work with refugees, can you raise funds for it? So uh, that's one way that we've really like clearly stuck to that, is that uh, you know, we go out and become an ethical project and platform in the world, or we can continue to build products that are focused on the Muslim community and really kind of go deep there, right? Um, and I think that's the that's the core value that we really are looking for, uh, you know, for, for you know for, for our vision for the next ten years, inshallah. Does that answer your question? Thank you, Salam alaikum. Uh, wonderful, uh, mashallah, presentation. Two things I uh, really loved up there was uh, seeing Ortegal. Uh, my children uh, come to me and they're like, look, a uh, Muslim hero, and uh, you know he wins without lying, or he's strong. And so uh, this is, uh, you know, and it, if it wasn't for him to be in English, uh, this couldn't be right. And then Mo Salah, and I'll share with you why Mo Salah uh, maybe emerges. I am Egyptian, but I also, it, 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 that's one of the reasons, but the the other big reason is um, just like uh, your struggle in the um, getting Bilal out in the Sundance uh, industry, I uh, struggled in uh, opening a sports agency for called Cora Stars. And so, you know, why am I not with the Weisermans? You know, in the uh, so this is a discussion. You know, it's like a Jewish agency. It's it's and it's known to be that way. So you either go under them, but to try to open a strong Muslim agency is very, very difficult, and there's the challenges of that. And to get the Muslims, who are many of them stars, to even unite to do it is, that's a whole other story. But on the, on the note of Gummy, which is what I really like, how have you guys done to promote just that word alone and to be able to maybe even get $1 from all the Muslims, right? If we could just do a campaign of that and have then have uh, $300 million uh, funding for your own good launch or so forth. This is this could be a little bit interesting, and I love how what you guys are doing. I just wanted to. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we, um, we definitely have been trying to you know, promote this idea in terms of gummy uh, quite a bit recently. It's mostly a uh, limited right now to when we go to high level events, conferences, speeches like these. Um, I think it would be great if there was a uh, focus kind of maybe digital marketing effort for it. Um, we probably need to come up with a better term than gummies. Um, uh, but yeah, it's good that you back and forth. We're, we're trying to figure out things. How to get them, that's the challenge. But I'll tell you something about this market. This market is very unique. 50% of it is under the age of 30. Almost every single one of them has a, a smartphone. So if you go to Rohingya camps in Bangladesh, you can't get a clean cup of, clean cup of water, but you can get a smartphone. So they're connected to the internet. They're on WhatsApp, heavily on WhatsApp. Um, they, uh, and they're young. And so I think the future is bright and also financially, I mean, they're, they're coming into the, you know, as a Muslim community, they're coming into our own. So there's a lot of bright opportunities, and I just pray that we, our heart remains there. It's never been an issue of number. When we were just at a dinner with a, a mentor of mine before this, and we were talking about the big issue that plagues the global Muslim community here in America and abroad. And Like morsels of food on a plate, like they're just, you 
know that when you're not on the if, if you're not sitting at the table, then you're on the menu, right? And the Sahaba are thinking, oh, is that because we're queue members? And the Prophet says, no, you're not queue members. Rather, you're like the co-currency. You're not, but you have no you have no substance to you. Right? And he said, they asked why, and what was his answer? What's the reason that we as Muslims are trying to find ourselves in this state? Two things. Look at those reasons. You can't remember, you can't remember them all. But when you love the Lord, and you are afraid to dislike Allah, and as a Muslim, we should be uh, protected from this world. Allah gives us dunya, alhamdulillah, He takes it away, alhamdulillah. But when we want to be with that dunya, then that's it. That's the best way because we're prepared for that day. We're, we're, we, we know that we're preparing ourselves for the presence of Allah. And so when that's the dunya in our heart and we look upon Allah the world, that's when we should be dedicated. It's not a number we're looking for. Yes, there's 300 million, there's a billion, 1.7 billion Muslims. But what's in our heart? That should all be what powers our heart. I just wanted to um, thank you and um, question if you have ever partnered with all the accelerators and incubators here and abroad um, because all of their startups can really use your program right thank you Anyone that's joining the startups, I'm sure you've seen these yourself. Those classes, like how to start a startup uh, by launch by Kamarin, are so valuable. We go through them every year with our new hires. Um, and uh, yeah, there's probably more we could do with incubators and stuff. Now we're out, you know, also, we as a company, and like, alhamdulillah, we've grown the size that we're beyond those type of programs. But I think you're right, we can do a lot with mentorship. Um, we're not doing it here. Uh, frankly, I think there's a lot more talented, knowledgeable entrepreneurs than us. But what's cool is some places like Malaysia, we're doing this stuff. Um, or specifically within the Muslim community, we spend a lot of time, like I spend a lot of time personally mentoring uh, other Muslim entrepreneurs. Um, and, and all of us are happy to do that. We all do that if anyone wants to stay in touch here and uh, just our support. So uh, we'll, we'll, I think you guys have Isha at 8 o'clock. Okay, I don't want to stop. We'll, we'll be, after this, we'll be at Mirti, inshallah. Come grab some tea with us. And I said, I'm just coming in. Thank you for coming in. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.